Helping him get untangled. Yeah. Do you need people? Inside Jalamabad. Not Joe. Yeah. Saw it. He fucked it. Yes. <laughs> Caught me. Look, I'm nicking Paul's plectrums to take home to give to my friends. You know, they've got slip not written on them. <laughs> You'll be wondering where they've gone, and I've got them. And you ain't gonna find it because I'm gonna take them all, everyone. Polly was just unassuming. He was so fucking gifted musically that I mean, even the subtle stuff. Like, I remember it was on Metabolic. I, I remember we were working on it, and something just wasn't sounding right to Polly. And uh, he, he suggested maybe just moving it a half a step, just this one little piece in the music, moving it half a step down. And it gave it such a different balance, a different vibe. And it was genius. I mean, it was the first time that I'd ever, like he just, he had such a great overview for music and yet such a, a, a great ear for just subtle nuances, man, just little things moving it around, trying different positions, you know, I mean, just, I mean, just that little slide and the song made so much more sense. I, I just, I'd never, I, I mean, everything, like all the exposure that I'd had to people write, writing music and whatnot was so basic until then, man. You come up with a riff, you, you, you know, two and two equals four and you got a song and yet he, heard so much different shit. He taught me a lot about writing music. He taught me a lot about what to listen for. He taught me about, you know, it's like you can't just look at it, the overview. You gotta listen for the details. You know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta fucking get into it. And he just had a, he just had such a gift for that. And um, the great thing was, is like when it came to, when it came to, when he was playing, had no ego, man. He would, he could lock in with the riff, and then he could lay back. You know, he could lay, he could lock in, and bounce back and forth between the riff and the drums. You know, and 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 supply that backbeat, supply that that natural bass that uh, you know a lot of technical players are very reluctant to do.
don't give a fuck. Hey guys, I just want to say one thing. It's been a pleasure working. recording of the Iowa record. It was kind of a dark time for me anyways and it, it was the first full record that I worked you know with the band on. Uh, basically when we got done touring on the first the first album cycle we finished Tattoo the Earth and like you know less than but you know less than three or four days of being home Paul was already calling me up to uh, you know to go over to uh, his brother Tony's basement where him and Joey were working on, uh, you know, we're already working on some of the demo stuff for the for the Iowa record. So essentially, you know, not even having a break from the first album cycle, I was already over with Paul and Joey working in Tony's basement on, you know, on the Iowa record. And, you know, we did that for a few weeks, like every night we'd get together, you know, and play for a few hours through all the tunes that we had at, the, at that point. And, uh, you know, we knew we were gonna do it with Ross and uh, we found out we were gonna do it at Sound City, which was, um, you know, pretty epic studio in, in the Valley in LA. Um, you know, some great records have been done there. Uh, I was shacked up with Chris. We were split in a place and, uh, you know, it, it was fun. I, you know, I had my Xbox set up and when I wasn't playing guitar or doing any of that shit, I was, uh, you know, partying because <laughs> that's uh, what we were doing at the time. Thank <laughs> you. 
Like the biggest thing uh, during that time that was the most influential on all of us was the business stuff. It was people who were meddling, people who were fractioning our band off into separate little groups, people who were creating conflicts where there didn't need to be any. Uh, you know, and that was that was dark. That was it was a fucking terrible time. You know. Once, once you have a band and, and you start having some success, the people who are, you know, were the people that they were are no longer, you know? And uh, that's usually for the worst, you know? I mean, it's, it's easy to inflate people's egos. All of a sudden you got people around you telling you the best whatever, you're the great, you know? It's how much do you listen to that? How much do you pay attention to it? You know, and what does it do to you? You know, it's all very poisoning. The entire industry is very poisoning. It takes like, you know, what was once fairly innocent, decent people and can turn them into absolute monsters, you know? So, I mean, that's something that uh, was taking place at that point. Not that anybody turned into a monster, but people being affected, being affected by all of the shit that's outside, you know, coming in on them. And uh, all of a sudden you've got more friends than you've ever had. You know, everybody wants to be your buddy girls who wouldn't fucking spit on you if your hair was on fire or, you know, asking for phone number, things like that. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty disgusting, really. You know, in, in terms of getting to see a darker side of humanity that you never got to see as just being a civilian that went to work every day, you know?
They're bla they're blazing, man. They're fucking kicking ass. Are you guys ready? I can't get out of them. Hold on. I can't. Get At this point, I'll, I'll sum it up like this. Just with, with what I have to say, is I love my eight brothers. There's no one like them. There's no one that can replace them. There's, there's no prosthetic for that. Not to, not to heal, heal a, a hurt heart. But Paul's still here. Iowa's still here. It's all here. And we're forging ahead. We're going on tour. And like, Iowa will live on forever. It's one of the, actually, I will say it, it's the heaviest and best metal record of all time. Done.
Iowa! All you need to know is now. Thank mm -hmm. you.